This is Growth Guide, a podcast exploring the depths of curiosity, questioning everything in the name of growth. I'm your host, Brian D'Alessandro. Today's guest is George Lewis, whose life has unfolded in a very enchanted way, as if straight from the pages of a novel. George is a true polymath, a professional artist, astrologer, healer that seems to herald from a different era. He's a romantic and a modern-day mystic. In our conversation, he takes us through his adventures that span from Italy to the Middle East to Asia and beyond. As a healer, George travels the world working from numerous healing temples that he's been building. But to understand how he got there, we start at the beginning. We discuss how Italy awoke his wanderlust and took him as an artist to the Middle East, painting for sheikhs and commoners alike. George has lived with Bedouin tribes in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Yemen, which connected him to the stars through their highly intuitive teachings. He then serendipitously became the court painter to the Sultan of Oman, yes you heard me right, and was eventually appointed the spiritual diplomat for Bhutan's Gross National Happiness Initiative. Ground yourself as we cross over timelines in the quantum realm and take a look at the exciting astrological year ahead. This episode is action-packed and Trigger Alert covers some controversial topics, along with the very nature of conspiracies and their root in the CIA. Anyone who can open their minds and hearts has an opportunity for exploring some uncharted territories. So take a deep breath, let go, and drop in. Hello, George. Thanks so much for joining today. It's really lovely to be with you, Brian. This is just such a lovely opportunity for us to get together. Yeah, since we've met, there's been a definite connection there. And the more I've learned about your background, which I'm excited to get into today, the more you just have this romantic journey of what it looks like in my mind to go down the path of being a healer from uh, being an artist to living in the Middle East uh, with Bedouins. And so I'd love to hear your journey from when you started off as an artist. And let's take it from there. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I really believe it's about so many of us, also the archetypes. I was born an artist. And as an astrologer, I always reference it as my Uranus is opposite my moon. So without getting into the astrology, the Iranian archetype was there right from the get go. And that is uh, the innovator, the questioner. It's the fool card in the tarot. It's stepping off into the abyss. I mean, I've been to 87 countries and most people say to me, George, were your parents in the diplomatic corps? And I say, no, actually they weren't. My parents, my entire family live in England. I think just from an early stage, I was deeply fascinated, uh, you know, outside home. And in a way, I'm always going to reference it to astrology because it's so powerfully transformative that my moon, my moon in Aries is in the ninth house. Moon, home, Aries, dynamic, ninth house, international, foreign, other, travel, beyond. So from a very early age, you know, it started like we used to go to ski holidays to France and Italy. And I just, Italy in particular, it was just, it was so exciting as an 11, 12 year old. It was very different from England. I don't want to say it was just always better, but I was, it was romantic. You see, for me, the, what, what is romantic? It's allowing the soul to soar, the soul to explore something in a radically free way. Because one can fall in love in so many different ways. I mean, the Greeks had many different classifications for love, you know, ranging from agape, which is spiritual love of God, to philios, which is the love of, of friends, and then um, eros. And then within eros, there are like five different variations. The point is, one can fall in love in many different ways. So it started with Italy, and then, of course, it moved. You know, I went to live in Hong Kong. I lived in New Zealand for a year, and then the Middle East. And in a way, the Middle East was for me, deeply romantic. It was exotic. The definition of exotic is something foreign to oneself. I was exotic to them. They were exotic to me. It was that sort of polarity that allows you to explore yourself and other people, you know, through art, through culture, through dialogue, and, um, you know, the study of the stars, living with Bedouins for a few months in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and genuinely seeing uh, Venus rise on the horizon, set on the horizon, Jupiter rise, and the entire 180-degree canopy 
of the sky, uninterrupted, unadulterated, is powerful. And, you know, you start asking questions about, uh, you know, where what, what does it mean? And that's when the astrology comes in. So there is definitely, for me, a deep sense of exploration. And that's my North Node in Sagittarius. Mm. Yeah, and we have such similarities. I mean, your moon is in Aries, my sun is in Aries, and then I have Sagittarius moon. And so, again, I think I always, in a very similar way, I see myself as an artist in everything I do. People are like, oh, what art are you creating? And for me, the act of just living life and exploring life is an artistic endeavor. So there's something very real about that. And then over to the Sagittarius of higher knowledge and travel that I am so pulled to in all ways of my life. And I love that you brought up this notion that you were in an exotic place and saw the other folks as exotic and they saw you the same. And so there's this creative tension of perspective that creates an opening and allows things to unfold that otherwise just wouldn't. And so it's, um, it's a really nice dynamic to call a light to. Also a calling to put ourselves in what might be seen as uncomfortable positions of being the other or the minority and actually sitting in that that difference or even discomfort as a way of exploring self and other it's a beautiful beautiful way of uh being it, it is i mean it, it's interesting because the archetype of pluto which is transformation you know uh, pluto touches whatever it touches it intensifies it's the it's the principle of the elemental power it's a depth psychology it's very intense and it's it's entirely instinctual. So when you're in the Middle East, um, obviously my Arabic was limited and, and non-existent to begin with, but I definitely was able to read and write it to an extent. And and I got better at it. But also I was very lucky. I had people who were able to to help me understand. But because it's so instinctual, the Middle East, you can con you can contact, especially with the Bedouin, it's amazing what you can communicate without words. Um, I ended up having my own camel. Uh, she's still alive. She's called Fatima. She's 12, 13 years old now, a white camel. I was gifted her uh, by the Al Rashidi tribe. And, wow. and they're very smart. And whenever I go back to Kuwait, and I haven't been back for five or six years, but they, they recognize you straight away. But you see, that was some time ago. And uh, the Middle East has always imprinted heavily on me, photographically and painterly, from a painter's perspective, because I was for a while, the court painter to the Sultan of Oman. So it was wonderful to be based in Oman, which is a country not really known in the United States. It's a, it's a country north of Yemen, but to uh, the east of Saudi Arabia. And it's a, it's a large country, but people haven't heard of it in America. Um, when I say Oman, they often think I'm talking about the capital of Jordan, which is Amman. Mm. And uh, it's very much originally part of the British area of, of control. It's connected to the Straits of Hormuz, where uh, all the oil goes in and out of, of the Gulf between Iran and Oman. And it plays a very interesting uh, place in the diplomacy between the Russians, the Americans, the Israelis and the Saudis. So it was I found it very fascinating being based there because I also got access to a lot of the politics and having studied politics and philosophy as my degree, not art. It was a really interesting way to morph my art into understanding human psychology and power. And when I look at it in power, I mean on multiple levels, psychic power to practical applications of power. Obviously, economic power is the main in instrument to exert that in this realm. So it, there was definitely for me a huge opening up and understanding, and which is still on, unfolding, by the way. You never finalize the understanding. I mean, what I've learned since the timeline shift of 2016 has been profound. I was still very much asleep when I was living in the Middle East between 20, 2007 and 2008 and 2012. But, but it appealed to my romance and I, it was a safe way to explore. But since 2016, I've become much more aware of the reality of this planet. And of course, that's always unfolding for all of us. But that is the great awakening that we're all involved in, in our own individual unique ways and i want to get into that but first i need to go back a little bit because it, this it's it feels like we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of years ago how how did you become the court painter to the sultan of oman well it was very interesting because i i 
my, my, my father was at Sandhurst, which is the military academy, with a man called Brigadier Timothy Landon. Now, Tim Landon, well, actually, my father was at the same school as him. What was so funny is I ended up meeting Tim Landon independently on my own because I was, became quite good, very good friends with his son, Arthur Landon. And Arthur's father, Brigadier, Brigadier Timothy Landon, was known as the White Sultan. And he was at Sandhurst with the Sultan of Oman. And they were best friends. And that whole relationship is a whole other story. But they were very, very close friends. And um, to put it quickly in a nutshell, is that Sultan, he became the Sultan of Oman in 1970. And he overthrew his father in a bloodless coup, which was backed by the British government. I mean, this is how things happened in Africa, in the Middle East, in large parts of the world for many, many years and still continue to happen. And this man ultimately, at the end of his life, became a bit of a Buddhist, became very spiritual. He started to collect my work. And we were having lunch together in London one day. And I'd had this dream, which I told him about, and it was about me in the Middle East. And he looked at me very seriously. He said, oh, I think it's now time for you to go. So he set up for me to go and, and paint. And it started as painting for a sheikh um, in Oman, Sheikh Ahmed Farid, who was actually once formerly a prince of Yemen. And I did these paintings and had these exhibitions. They went very well. And then I was asked to become the court painter to the Sultan of Oman. It sort of happened organically, gradually. And, I, and, and what was so interesting about being in Oman is I had the ability to travel around with my camera, meet people. And so the painting was almost like the veneer, but it was behind it. It was the psychological connections that I made, the relationships I made, the questioning, asking the men and the women, photographing, I mean, all sorts of people. I have a whole collection of photography called Sexuality and Gender in the Middle East. And it's all about the private expression of the soul in the Middle East, where most Americans, Europeans, especially Americans, would consider it so dangerous. They think of terrorism. And it's not that that's not true. But there's this whole other side of sensuality, the smell of juniper, the smell of frankincense and myrrh, you know, which you get into the raw smell of musk and umber and all these different um, sides. The smells are very, very potent and powerful in the Middle East. It's just it, it opens up a whole other realm. So that, that when I was caught painter, it just it gave me this ability to explore the Arabian Peninsula in a way that most people couldn't. Mm. And the duties of being the court painter, what, what does that look like? Well, it was quite open. I was doing the paintings of camels, of Bedouins, of castles for the royal court. I never actually was commissioned to paint his majesty. He was quite old at this time. I mean, actually, he died two and a half years ago of cancer, very sadly. But um, it just it was just an amazing way for me to explore the world and, and the country. I mean, I traveled and throughout the, the empty court and the, into the deserts. And it was just incredible. Um, I mean, I could share with you some of the photographs. I mean, it's them, they're, they're epic. Yeah, I would love to. And I'll link them here. So if you're listening to this, if you head over to our YouTube channel, you'll uh, find them there. But I think in a way what it did is it set me up the Middle East. Uh, as as a real explorer of the psyche. And then obviously moving to America and going to live in New York City, having lived in a very Arab part of the world, was, you know, quite frankly, I grew up Gentile. I grew up within a Christian background. I lived for many years with Muslims and Arabian Muslims. And I, obviously I was in Syria. I spent a long time in Yemen. I've been all over Iraq. And then I go and move to a city like New York City, which is very Jewish. Um, that is a really useful way of putting cultures together to really get a sense of what are the underlying energetics of humanity where are the real commonalities and where are the differences and that's been very helpful for me in understanding psyche now as a therapist when i'm dealing with people from different parts of the world because i have real practical experience of the programs we are all programmed as a species our belief systems our programs, all of us. It doesn't matter whether it's the atheist from New York City or the, the zealot Christian from the South. The extreme of the atheist is no different from the extreme of the religious zealot, whether he's Muslim or Jewish or Christian or Hindu. It's, it's an intransigent faith that I am right and everyone else is wrong. And also I have to save you. There's no other way to God than my way. 
it's so deeply corrosive, but also the atheist view is so corrosive because it's nihilism. It's giving up on any understanding of energy, the divine consciousness. It's interesting. There's a, a giving up and also a closing off. Anytime we have beliefs, they're dangerous because we attach to them and they can constrict our curiosity, our creativity, and the natural flow. You talk about this energy. It's my belief that this energy wants to flow. And the more open we are as a conduit, the more it will flow or else just like a river, it's going to go elsewhere. So true. It's so true. It's being open to that. Yeah. And being open to the fact that we've all, like computers, been programmed in a certain way as a species. And, you know, one of the big driving forces for me as a North Node Sagittarius is to allow that dialectic, that conversation between us to really open up like a child. Why do children heal so quickly normally? They heal so quickly because there's that curiosity driving them. They're not fixed in their identity. They're not fixed in their belief system. They are in motion. It's beautiful. And when we can take on that archetype, we heal much quicker because we're free to explore without limitation. Yes, we have boundaries, of course, good, good Saturn, good boundaries, but ultimately we're not constricted by these artificial constructs which are belief systems. And that is all this Pluto going into Aquarius, which we can talk about later if you want, about the, really the takedown of these old antiquated belief systems, but still very much realigning with Christed light consciousness, the higher realms of love. What you're bringing light to here is very interesting. Another really interesting aspect is that in this modern day and age, most of our belief systems are very much of the human construct where when we look back at our indigenous people who were living in harmony and connection to mother nature, the majority of the stories they inherited and the conditions that they inherited were in connection to the natural world around them. And so we're born into a conditional world. So naturally we are indoctrinated and that's not positive or negative or innately. And so really thinking about, okay, what do we surround ourselves with? What are we consuming? And, and how connected are we to the natural world as a way of building belief systems around something larger than self? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's absolutely all about that, is understanding the construct. And once we understand that, it is, that's one of the versions of red pilling. You know, The Matrix is a documentary. So and, let's talk a little bit about that for listeners who aren't familiar with some of these terms. You're talking about the Great Awakening and red pilling in reference to the Matrix, where you're offered the red or the blue pill. You want to unpack some of this? Yeah, I mean, there's so many ways into this. And I don't, you know, everyone's going to have their um, level of understanding. But for me, you know, most people now have heard of the Great Reset, you know, Klaus Schwab talking about the Great Reset. I mean, you know, one has to really be living under a rock if one doesn't understand what the World Economic Forum in Davos has been pushing. And, you know, for those who don't know, I implore you to do your own research because freedom is information and information when applied becomes knowledge. And when knowledge is applied, it becomes wisdom. So the Great Reset brings about the Great Awakening. So dangers tend to push us towards higher levels. I always talk about this, the emergence through the emergency, or the emergency creates the emergence. Mm, mm. It's very important that. So what is the Great Awakening? It's coming out of the cave. Think of the allegory of the cave by Plato. It's very serious. It's like, okay, who are we as a species? What is our true history, his story? What is her story? What is the truth about humanity and our connection to cosmos, to psyche, our reality? Now, in asking that question, for people who are still in the cave and entertaining these ideas are in many ways earth shattering, right? They shake the very and break the very foundation that we're standing on. What advice can you give there for anyone who is curiously opening their eyes and exploring, but also feeling the anxiety and the crumbling that comes about from it? Because there is definitely a death and a rebirth. Yeah, I mean, firstly, community is essential. 
And that's something I offer to a lot of people. I have an amazing expanding community that I'm part of. It's circular. There's nothing pyramid. There's no more queen with her handbag sitting on top. And, you know, I can show you that in the astrology, how that's totally changing. But it's coming together to share like we're doing today, to be open to the fact that we haven't been told the truth. You know, what's the difference between conspiracy and truth? Well, these days it's less than six months. <laughs> you know, so um, it's the sense of coming to an understanding and it isn't easy for a lot of people because it takes the carpet away from under your feet, but then you install the new carpet. And, you know, if you want to use the analogy of the carpet, you know, it's the magic carpet. I mean, we are learning about time travel. We're learning about our galactic heritage we're learning more about many stuff that has been hidden from us let's take ancient egypt let's go back to the dead sea scrolls i mean there's so many ways in and you the listener have mm -hmm. to decide what is it that you want to focus on where is your truth you know some people in the great awakening want to talk about the federal reserve and jekyll island and the sinking of the titanic they want to go down in the economic to understand the structures that came in very masculine in a way 1871 and the corporatization of the United States of America by the Europeans, followed up by the third Federal Reserve in 1913 after the sinking of the Titanic and the control systems through usury and through the corporate and and the um, the financial instruments, the systems that come into place. Other people want to go more galactic. Roswell, 1948, and the and the suppression of information to do with alien technologies and reverse engineering. We haven't got time to talk about uh, all this, but you, the Great Awakening, you do your research on where you feel intuitively tap into the body, use tap the sternum and sense what is it that you feel called to investigate, which will help you create and reestablish your Uranian energy, which is your godlike curiosity, childlike curiosity to bring you more into alignment with what you're here to do. We're not here as slaves to work in a system to pay taxes and to die. That is a distortion of our reality. We're coming to realize that now. It's very exciting because we're asking these questions. People like yourself, Brian, are holding platforms for people to explore this. 10, 15 years ago, unless you were David Icke, it wasn't happening. So let's talk some more about this because even as you bring up terms like conspiracy, you know, what's now public domain, right? There have been all types of releases and declassifications from, let's focus on the US government, right? For cases like Roswell and different um, alien aspects, there's also, you know, um, cases of history being grossly inaccurate. And by the way, um, anyone listening, uh, I suggest Graham Hancock as a great way to get a lot of information, factual information around different history of this planet and civilizations. Finger, fingerprints of the gods is, I mean, he's written many good books. I think that's a brilliant one because, I mean, it's, you know, it's quite some time old now. It's yeah. easily 15 years old, uh, maybe more, I can't remember. But it's brilliant because it does look at the timeline of Egypt uh, and 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 sacred sites in Turkey, and it really makes you question the official narrative. Well, and so then we can talk about the CIA, right, um, releasing documents around their MK Ultra programs, which are it sounds very science fiction, but they have programs that are still in operation that are designed around psychological aspects of mind control and manipulation at gross scales. And these have been used in warfare, but also turned on the uh, American public for quite some time. This is stuff that's been disclosed by the government. So it's not that it's um, anything woohoo. In fact, the terms like that and the terms of, of conspiracy labeling something as misinformation and disinformation are actually tactics of the CIA. So just dig deep. Uh, the one thing, you know, I think that's important as you, like you said, George, connecting to that intuition and following something that's calling, create a space for yourself, even if it's just for that hour that you do your exploration, try to drop your cognitive bias, try to drop any of the ego attachment to what reality looks like and be a true scientist. Look for facts, test for something, try to prove it wrong, but be open when you have information that proves it otherwise. I, I absolutely. And I think the other thing is to really understand the concept of inversion. 
when the mainstream media, and we're talking the whole gamut here, we're talking Fox through CNN, BBC, the whole mainstream media is there to create a narrative, has always been there. It is part of the propaganda machine. Why it's been so successful is that human beings did not realize this until recently. So the ones who are still stuck, head in the sand, are the ones who are going to suffer the most over the next few years, because until they wake up to understand the reality. We see our sensory systems, they allow us to interact with the world on the 3D level. But we also have these powerful extrasensory systems that help us sort of imagine things into our future and look back in time through the past. You know, we're able to exist in a space of thought alone. So we have been lied to about many different things. And in some ways, the greatest lies about our own very nature. When we talk about junk DNA, no, it's, 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 it's hidden DNA in the sense of it hasn't been turned on for a while. We're powerful beings. And once we can cleanse ourselves through detoxification, because we have been targeted, you know, chemtrails is real. Geoengineering under HARP, H-A-A-R-P, goes back to the late 50s. It is what it is. And if people don't like that, it's okay, but then you've got to figure it out. My job is, is to help people who are willing to come out of the cave and to realize that we've all been looking at a tell a lie vision television mm. now back to your regular scheduled programming yes and so this is an awakening this is what the great awakening is deeply speaking really the great awakening is to do with consciousness we have these huge capabilities contained in our consciousness when you look at under a microscope there's no such thing as solid uh, it's all energy and the great revelation is that a matter really is subservient to consciousness mm. and our thoughts generate our consciousness what we put energy into becomes our manifested reality we have to support each other in this the indians have an ancient word for it called the sangha the community so we here's what i would advise do some of your research go down a rabbit hole of your choice to explore something that resonates with you and then once you've done that, and if you feel a little distortion because you're suffering what's called cognitive dissonance, go into, back into the meditation, either on your own or with community. Bring together, calm down, anchor yourself, naked feet on the, on the earth, in the water. You sort many different protocols. As a healer, I, I've got buckets of them. We all have access to those protocols to help you ground. But then once you're grounded, go back in. And what you'll do, you'll end up becoming the alchemist because you will be understanding more cognitively and putting it together of where the distortion has been. Why is the schedule 78 vaccines now for children? Just ask that question. It's not for me to answer it today. Children are born divine, powerful soul beings why is it that children often have memory of past lives and and have these amazing downloads and suddenly once they become adults it's gone it's very deliberate that it's killing the ability of us humans to ascend it's keeping us in a 3d matrix it is what it is if people still think that's conspiracy that's okay but you are going to live in a very different timeline and this is where i become the shaman and this is why i i'm, I'm my house is packed in the ninth house i do prophecy it is what it is it's coming. You have a choice. Are you on the side of human evolving into higher levels of consciousness, which is Christed light? Or are you going to be stuck in an old Saturnian, Satan, Saturn system through fear, 72 hertz? Or are you going to choose the light, which is 432 or 550, 528? It doesn't matter. It's going up ascension. We are literally ascending into a new paradigm. We have a choice. That's called freedom. That's free will. I choose love. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about this idea of the multiverse. So as George is talking about ascending and being on this higher frequency and even different timeline, this is the notion that in the multiverse, there exists infinite realities of every permutation of what is possible. And so depending on if you're on, when people say, right, that vibe or that frequency, are you in a higher state or a lower state? 
you you know when you've felt different sensations of feeling in your body and when you're in a high place and you're feeling completely open and loving and connected versus one where you feel disconnected depressed or angry or anything like that so the idea is that when you're in a lower state versus a higher state you're actually shifting into a different reality so within the multiverse so the idea that you leave others behind, even with the ascension, in, if you look at the coming of days, right, or the ending of days, it's not that everyone necessarily dies or, or everyone ascends to heaven. It's that people are, are living in these different timelines of higher vibration or lower vibration. And while this all sounds very out there, we're living in these exciting times where we're seeing the study and advancement in quantum physics and all of these new spaces um, that are proving many of these aspects and really alluding to uh, you know what we're talking about in the grand way. So very exciting times. Again, uh, I invite you to be open, explore and trust your own intuition, something that might be completely turned off, because as we're talking about, that's been programmed into our upbringings, whether it's intentional or not, it doesn't matter. There's a great study I've mentioned before on this podcast, conducted by NASA, that studies creativity and imagination from the age of, I think, like four years old, all the way up into adulthood. And there is an exact correlation on their maps of that age once you go into the public school system and move through it and that decrease of creativity and imagination. And so, again, we need to reclaim these aspects of ourselves. They are innate to us. They are these gifts that are given. And it's our choice. This is our life. So you get to choose if you want to go that path or if the other way is working for you do it. Like, I'm not saying you should or shouldn't do anything, right? And if something's working, you know, enjoy it. But uh, if not, take control. Yeah, beautiful. I mean, what what is also interesting with my North Node in Sag, I want to encourage as much of humanity to claim their power back. So I will always encourage you through some interesting statistics that the positive optimist always lives at least a decade longer than the negative nihilist. And then beyond that is when you step into the ability, let's take medicine and the true Hippocratic Oath of understanding energy and frequency and how really no disease can exist in the body uh, when you operate at the right frequency. That is entreating you to do more investigation because you really pull yourself out of a fear-based protocol and into something which is incredibly liberating and uh, many of us uh, and i speak for myself it we are better at doing it when we're supported with friends joining in it's hard to be just the individual in this world you know fighting for it or you know encouraging other people but there are more and more of us doing this i mean these conversations wouldn't have happened 10 15 years ago in the same way it's very exciting so look out for you know other mutual friends you are going to make new friendships new relationships i mean the great awakening does push people into making choices in a way that we didn't have to to, in the past and you know it's very important to be aligned with your close in a circle. I think that message of community is so, so tantamount to really being able to endure and evolve, right? Going at it alone, it's a matter of time before you get pulled back down or beaten down from the the norm. And uh, having that community creates a container that's safe to explore these spaces and to create accountability for each other. Also, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, we've transition to a very transient culture. This is partly due to the geographical spread. It's largely due to the digital uh, lives that we're living. But when we create community where there's consistency and continuity, we're held to a certain standard, we're held accountable, and we are supported in what our higher intentions are. And that's that's, I feel, the the human and spiritual journey merged together. Yeah, it's interesting because in March 7th, Saturn moves into Pisces. And uh, that's a big shift. I mean, literally Saturn is structure and Pisces is water, structured water. I mean, sometimes astrology can be very literal, um, but it's putting boundaries and support structures down Saturn 
into Pisces areas, which is cosmology. I mean, it's going to be time travel. It's going to be understanding space. It's going to be understanding other civilizations on this planet, not just our own. It's a huge, huge expansion into the area of understanding the occult and, and what is magic. I mean, let's just go back to the archetype of Star Wars because it's an easy entry point for human beings because most humans have watched Star Wars. The occult, the dark, which means hidden, the, the people controlling the system have used black magic since time immemorial. It is what it is. What's exciting is people like ourselves are encouraging other people now to understand the occult, to use white magic in a way to support the Christed light, love, consciousness. So the battle in the realm of polarity on planet Earth can be not any more equal, but also can be more supportive of our true human destiny. So Saturn in Pisces, in some ways, is putting structures down into understand numerology, gematria, astrology, tarot, which the city of London, the Vatican, and DC, and the hidden um, Masonic lodges, which have been there for a long, long time, have used. It is what it is. And now we're coming to be able to understand it. It is Yoda as opposed to the Sith Lord. You know, where is your Yoda? How are you accessing your Yoda? Mm. What is your hero's journey? Where are you on? Have you stepped over the threshold? You know, Luke Skywalker. You are all Luke Skywalker. You know, it doesn't matter that it's being played out as a male if you're a female. It's the archetype of stepping over the threshold and, and, and embarking on your hero's journey. It's very yeah. Sagittarius. And so, uh, George Lucas was a huge fan of um, Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. Uh, I did a podcast previously, two-part podcast. If anyone is unfamiliar or familiar and interested, go back and listen to that. You'll learn more about the Hero's Journey. Um, really, really intrinsic aspects of how we live our lives and what our arcs look like. And I think, you know, the aspect of looking for our teachers and asking for our teachers is another big one. While creating community support is big, also finding those teachers out there, those that are further along than us and wielding the values and virtues that we aspire to, to really bring us closer to that place of being. I mean, if I were to come on again, I'd bring in my double chalice. I have this incredible musical instrument, which is um, made of crystalline quartz infused with sapphire. It's a very unique piece. It's a double chalice and they're a perfect fifth. So one is an A, one is a D. And when you do it, 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 it alchemizes and balances uh, the auric field. It actually gets rid of tinnitus and many other things. I mean, this is very much Saturn in Pisces. It's understanding that we are so much frequency and once mm. we can align and tune into the right frequency we are in such a powerful creative position and i think that's what is is emerging on our planet today and yes it feels hard because the darkness is being revealed visibly for the first time to most of humanity and it's uncomfortable but take the opportunity to turn that discomfort into some decentralized local creative project of yourself yeah it reminds me of the book paulo Coelho of um warrior uh, oh, yes. no the alchemist i love and that you know your story reminds me of that of the alchemist but i'm going to the warrior of the light so oh, yes. a short book and look we are living in this time where there are hard hard realities unfolding in front of us there are very hard choices to be made it's my belief that we have individually and collectively incarnated at this time, at this place, because this is our work. And so we could either run from it or hide from it or fight and resist it, or we could embrace and remember that we're here to do this work and tap into our inner warrior and do it from a place of love, but with great strength and grounding. And uh, let's do it together. And As you say, Brian, so correctly, there are these uh, power points. There are these times when the Pluto goes conjunct Mercury or Uranus makes an exact square with Saturn where we suddenly get a barrage of information that comes in. But, you know, you'll have to, you're going to have to find that information on the, on the non-mainstream media because mm. on the mainstream media, it's run by the old system. Saturn is still in charge of the old propaganda. It's also an invitation to start developing your own 
intuition and your connection to this greater unfolding. One of the most beautiful aspects of astrology is it allows you to see what's unfolding on a much larger planetary scale. And when we're doing things that are in alignment, all of a sudden it's effortless. We're not fighting the river anymore. And so it's, you know, I know I wake up and I know when the moon is in Aries or the moon is in Virgo without even paying attention. I know energetically. And every time it's like clockwork, I was like, wait, let me check. I check. And of course it is. You start to recognize the energetic signature. And I know I can use those energies for different things when I should be more productive in nitty gritty work or when I should be, you know, in Mercury, when I should be really talkative and communicative and really, you know, focusing on business. I mean, these are simple ways of tuning in and developing that relationship that is really fun yes it's interesting because i believe today uh, the moon is uh, halfway through libra um correct and so we are going to be today purely with libra talking in in balanced terms seeking uh, the scales of justice equilibrium and obviously that's at a higher frequency at low frequency it can be a, deliberately trying to distort that when the moon is in Aries, and you and I, you know, have discussed this privately because we both have Aries signatures, is, uh, you know, the, the hospitals have to stock more blood because there are more accidents on the road because people are more reckless. Now, the positive of that is people are taking more chances to be more dynamic, to step into their sacred masculinity and to protect wife and family and, 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 and one's fellow human being. The low frequency is, you know, the bloodlust and because it's ruled by Mars. Once we understand these archetypes, they're very powerful and we can activate them. And we have, you know, astrology really, astrologers rather are in constant dialogue with nature. And dialogue is a two-way process. You know, astrology unites the eternal and the temporal as above, so below. You know, reading a horoscope is a, is a ritual of divination uh, in which alchemy is activated. And, you know, both parties are changed through that process. It's very, very empowering. I mean, I'm so blessed that I get to read so many um, charts of people each week. You know, I learn so much from that experience of learning about the psyche of other people. And so it's, 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 it's a real blessing astrology it's all about uh, self illumination and, and self-knowledge and that allows us to be more loving human beings because when we have more self-knowledge we're less controlled by saturn we're less controlled by the programs and we can be free to express our love human beings are very empathic creatures human beings really are are the frequency of love that is our true frequency it is the distortion of ai the distortion of uh, a different energy system that seeks to keep us in the 3d matrix that is a documentary matrix and the more we can realize that and bring power back and you've got to do it in your way you know tom dick and harry they all have different archetypes take what resonates with from me today and ignore the rest absolutely okay so we're covering a lot of amazing ground here and i want to come back to astrology and taking a look at what's on the horizon for the year ahead but before we do that i have to tap into my romantic uh, yearning of hearing more about living with the Bedouin people. There's something so magical about that. And when we were in Morocco and, you know, on the dunes, we saw Bedouins and we got to have tea with them, but just for a brief moment. And man, there's such an attraction I, I had to the, these people and I'd love to learn more. Yeah. Um, so much of communication is not through words. So much of communication is through the energetics of, because you're, you're around the campfire. So everything is reversed in the desert. In the daytime, especially around high noon, two, three hours either side of high noon, one is really going slowly, conserving one's energy, and sometimes trying to find shade. And you really slow down almost towards a hibernation. It forces you because of the extreme heat to really, really slow it down. It's a meditation in itself. By contrast, once that sun goes down, the campfire is lit. They're incredible at preserving the wood and reusing the wood. The wood is hard in the desert. It lasts a long time. And the stories 
around the campfire, the legends. They can be very romantic. They can be very spiritual. They can be very cosmic. Now, of course, there's always a layer to it because Islam was very infiltrated as well. All the religions have been infiltrated. It is what it is. So I don't want to overpaint the romance as far as, you know, are they all reciting the poetry of Rumi? Uh, no, but there is a kindness, a humanity in the desert that of the of Arabia that I will never forget. And there's a beauty of understanding the stars, the expansiveness, understanding nature so well. I mean, at one point, a giant, it was called a, a camel spider, in the middle of the day, started to run towards me. And I remember this is right at the beginning of my experience. And I got a little spooked because it's the size of my hand stretched out. What was it doing? It was just running for shade. It was running to stand next to me to get into the shade because it was 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's like, OK, you just start to learn. And then the dates that one eats out there are phenomenal because you eat five or six dates in the morning between tea and coffee. And it really sets you up. It gives you a slow release of energy for the next five, six hours. The amazing amount of energy is contained in one single date, especially the dates out there. So it, it, it was beautiful. And the friendships I made were, were very profound. And I'm still in contact with many of them. Hmm. What was the food like besides the date and tea? Uh, so uh, a lot of goat and lamb, hmm. which I like very much. Rice, quite basic. Some spice, especially in Oman and certain parts of Saudi Arabia, when the Silk Route or the trading routes are open to India. You see, what you begin to understand is how the ancient trading routes worked. So once spice can come in from India and that part, then you have more access to those tastes. If, for example, you aren't able to get hold of those spices, then the food becomes quite bland again. So it depends on whereabouts you are in, 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 in the desert or, you know, your access point to the cities, uh, you know, the trade routes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Such a far cry from, uh, going to the local whole foods and, uh, picking up anything and everything under the sun. Um, again, it, it goes back to these, these ways of living in more natural rhythms where they're governed by larger realities. It's actually, it makes me think, because I lived in a, in Bhutan for a number of years too. Oh, I yes, was, I want to get into this as well. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, we probably don't have time today, but I mean, what was so interesting living in Bhutan is, you know, when I painted the royal family there and I did their astrology, I ended up spending quite a lot of time in the northern part on the Tibetan border, high up, it's like 12, 15,000 feet above sea level. And the food becomes quite spicy there, but the food energetics are phenomenal because there's no GMO, there's no influence of other negative forces and you just feel the energy of those mountains the creative sunlight to infuse you with the right energy and I remember coming back also acclimatizing to that altitude when I came back to New York the next month when I was in New York having spent a month previously in Oman I was super fit in a way that I I wasn't before on a level that I wasn't before because of that experience of food and altitude mm-hmm yeah, uh, I remember going up to Tiger's Nest as part of acclimation there, and you just see the locals that are taking these incredible elevation gains and doing it so naturally. I also shared the same experience of the liveliness of food there. Uh, everything was so flavorful and so, so rich. It was, yeah, just really unique. We, we do we, we need to do another uh episode just on bhutan because i could show you maybe maybe what we could do next time i can show you some in, in, in images as well uh Love the paintings that. photographs of bhutan as well as the middle east it could be more more visual if you would like i love that that sounds really fun before we wrap up let's jump to uh to back to astrology and take a look at uh, a little forecast if that sounds good to you Absolutely. I, what I would say, uh, Brian, is the, the, the two big things going on this year are Saturn moving into Pisces and, and Pluto moving into Aquarius. The last time Pluto moved into Aquarius was the French Revolution um, and also the reign of terror. So you see, Aquarius is belief. 
Pluto is transformation of belief systems. We are going to see an absolute radical shift of all things to do with human belief system. Uh, for example, religions, they are going to fundamentally shift between now and 2042. So it's going to be all about um, moving out of an old antiquated belief system into something much more new. Now, on a, on a positive level, it's going to be us tapping into our consciousness, tapping into our divinatory individuality. On a negative, it's going to be some people choosing AI, some people choosing um, it to give up their their sovereignty, which is already what started to happen, unfortunately. I, mean, so I have a lot of radical compassion for these people who are in fear that they've accepted tooth and nail what the government has told them, uh, what the doctor has told them. I mean, the whole programming system within the medical is is deeply, deeply disturbing because it, it really, when you understand it, it is about transhumanism and depopulation. And that realization is going to be very apparent over the next few years as, as Pluto moves into Aquarius. And it, it's going to be radical, radical disclosure because what Pluto and Capricorn did is it brought focus on the institutions. So the, the institutions are going to collapse between 2008 and 2024 which is Pluto in Capricorn. But because of the retrograde cycle, we get a glimpse of Pluto in Aquarius starting in March this year, just for three or four months. And then it goes back into Capricorn until the end of 2024. So we're going to see the end of these, the Federal Reserve, the end of the big BBCs, the CNNs, the end of McDonald's, you name it. Those corporations, they, uh, Disney, they've run to the end of their line. You know, it is what it is because they don't carry the frequency of what humanity needs today so that's exciting and the astrology backs that up tooth and nail in 2023 it is a spiritual year two plus two plus three is seven it is the year of the water rabbit yes the last time it was the year of water rabbit was jfk's assassination that's interesting uh but it's really a time for uh, a spiritual ingenuity creativity uh to blossom on this planet and so we're going to see a lot of local creative projects emerge this year which are going to have strong spiritual conscious connections mm, george so so wonderful to hear your truth and your interpretation thank you so much for joining today my absolute pleasure to be here with you thank you so much for having me on, on your show thanks for joining us this week on growth guide a big thanks to our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by the Permaculture Education Institute. You may have listened to the episode I did with founder Morag Gamble. She's incredibly knowledgeable in permaculture practices and communes with nature on the deepest of levels. The conversation we had revealed how returning to a healthy relationship with nature brings us internal peace and harmony. Whether in schools, prisons, on farms, or in our backyards, the result's always the same. Morag devotes her life to restoring our soil and enriching community. Whether you're looking to level up an established career, or into community farming, or being called to this field for your next chapter, the wealth of knowledge and wisdom Morag offers is paramount. This is where the Permaculture Educators program comes in. It's a global online learning community led by Mora Gamble. The program includes dual certificates of permaculture design and permaculture teaching. If you're called to be a part of the positive change growing around the world through living simpler, speaking up, and teaching permaculture, this course is for you. For anyone looking to make permaculture their way of life and their livelihood too. For more information, visit growthguide.love forward slash perma. This episode is sponsored by Morning Man. Live manly, own the morning. I learned about this from UFC champ Frank Shamrock. He was always having trouble getting started in the morning without like seven or eight cups of coffee. No exaggeration, I've seen this in person. So he created this product that's packed full of 45 superfoods and it has 95 milligrams of clean caffeine. So you get that charge from the greens and also get a hit from the caffeine without feeling all jacked up. I'm definitely caffeine sensitive and I like this product because it doesn't make me feel like I'm bouncing off the walls, but I feel sharp and energized to get shit done. Visit growthguide.love forward slash morning man to learn more and use promo code growth for 15% off. I'd also like to thank our sponsor Atmananda Yoga. 
You guys have got to check out their yoga alignment mat. I've been using this for a long time. As you know by now, I've studied and trained with them as a yoga teacher, and the mat is incredible to deepen your practice and to ensure a lifelong injury-free practice. Visit growthguide.love forward slash alignment for more info or to buy. Be sure to use code GROWTH at checkout for 15% off. Make sure to visit our website, growthguide.love, where you can find freebies, exclusive content, and subscribe to the show so you'll never miss an episode. If you found value in listening, I'd really appreciate a rating on iTunes. I can't tell you just how important this is. Or spread the love. Tell your friends, your fam, heck, tell your spirit animals. And follow me on Instagram at growthguide.love. Be sure to tune in next week for our newest episode.